And uh, ladies and gentlemen, here comes uh, Miss Palaz Academy now, Ahmed Musa, uh, the nimble striker for his side. Ahmed Musa now, gangling and rampaging like a buffalo. What does he do now? He tries to find his teammate. Back to this man again, Ahmed Musa. And he goes in there. This could be danger. Ladies and gentlemen, here comes Miss Palaz. What do they do with the ball? And they turn You get no accolades for identifying the overwhelming degree of popularity that the game of football enjoys in Nigeria or the abundance of natural talent that abounds on virtually every street corner, playground and school pitch. Football is a number one sport and a national pastime in Nigeria. Nigeria's history of organized football and it dates as far back as the 1940s. And while there has been a few bright spots in terms of events and personalities, the level of development is still quite some distance from where things ought to be. It doesn't require a third eye to identify the problem or the long list of problems with Nigerian football. Neither does it require any iota of genius to identify the solutions. However, it surely requires vision, courage, and unwavering commitment to attempt a solution. The solution is simple, albeit far from easy. Change the processes, change the outcomes. Right before our eyes, a revolution is unfolding, and thankfully, it is being televised. This is Mies Palace Football Academy, Nigeria's premier citadel for grooming and nurturing future champions in the beautiful games of football and life. In spite of many daunting challenges, certain sectors have continued to witness commendable growth over the last decade or so. Nigerian music, film, fashion, and tech spaces have recorded impressive strides. But even with significant competitive advantage, local football hasn't done quite as well. Well, it's a very telling issue that has remained over time. When you talk about um, football development with regards to you know, our young starlets, to exactly the reality we have on ground with our senior uh, players. You know, just to put things in perspective for you, we've won the under-17 a record five, five times. And when I say a record, I mean no other nation has ever done this. Now you would expect that if you've done that at the under-17 level, at least you should have won the under 20, maybe what, two or three times. Then I know if when it comes to the World Cup, which is more or less the premium package there, we should be at say quarterfinals, semifinals. So we basically are building towards that. But the reality we have before us is, yes, we've won the under 17 five or six times. The under 20, we've only managed to get to the final, I think once. We have never won it. With the senior national side, it's been a case where you know, the round of 16 basically is our bus stop. Every sector of the Nigerian economy is a mirror of the Nigerian society. The footballing family is not any different. And as long as the country suffers from the ailments of corruption, having the wrong people in the wrong places, as long as we suffer from nepotism, as long as we worry still about tribalism, as long as the country is divided along ethnic lines, football is not immune from those fault lines. Therefore, football is going to continue to be run um, the way it is, except, of course, something 
really drastic happens or we wake up and take football by the scruff of the neck and agree to change the way football is run in Nigeria. Football and sports cannot develop in isolation in Nigerian state. That's one. Two, only the quote-unquote failures or those who can't succeed at all is very unusual. To have a doctor, I mean, Nigeria has less than 15 sports physicians that have any form of training. Nigeria has less than 20. I'm absolutely sure of that. Except things have changed in the last one year, they have less than 20. So only those, uh, no, and you want to think about sports law, you want to think about, there are very few absolute professionals. So who are the people in sports? The semi-literates, the half-literates, the ex-footballers. I mean, you don't have 9 ones and go on to play football. Not even Stephen Keshi had 9 ones and went on to play football, was probably Nigeria's greatest player. And these are the people who go into administration. So it's a run of the litter, usually, that run our sports. I could remember when we came back from World Cup, we went to the Mexico it seems to see the senior World Cup. On our return, all of us were obtained to the under 20. Unfortunately, the then coach of the under 20 preferred to use just few of our players. We attack government property, which we are not allowed to join any club or to travel out. We are opportune to have an academy in Germany to take care of all of us but refused by the then federal government under Ibrahim Babangida. The plans the Buhari government we are having and idea would have much better for our youth. We've been co-opted into some of the schools so that we'll be able to be playing together at the same time going to school. Most of my colleagues, some of them achieve at the club level, but at the national level, because of the setup we have, our, we found ourselves we could not go beyond the under-20 national team. Apart from Duka Ogbade, Jonathan Akpobori, they make a stand at the senior national level. So the government property tag really affected us. So the mindset, the paradigm that needs to change, and I think it needs to change first and foremost from people who administer football in this country. It is too political at this point in time. And I have stories littered everywhere and experiences I've had from different places across the country that I have been to where it is hard to find a technocrat handling football in that state. It's always a case of uh, this guy did very well. He handed his, uh, his territory in the, in the last election. So we need to look for something for him. Football now becomes something where you, you used to reward people, not because they're good enough. And it's not at a regional or state level, even at a national level. Because then you have, I promise you this now, the Minister for Health has to be a medical doctor. Minister for Justice has to be a minimum son, not even go anywhere, you know. I'm saying you put people who are knowledgeable, who are in that business to handle that ministry. But you see where it comes to Minister for Sports, it's all come as a fair. You can literally put anybody there. The reason why Nigeria have not been able to attain um, success, let me put it that way, in, on the national um, grid is simple because at youth level, there's a lot of cheating that has been involved. That so many times the coaches and even the administrators are involved in each cheat, doing things uh, not proper. Nigeria has done very well at youth football level, but then we do not have the foundation, you know, that should have made it better in transiting from senior, junior to senior teams. Nigeria has won the Under-17 World Cup, we've won um, the Under-17 African Cup, Under-20 and all that, but then you find that um, age again plays a lot of uh, tricks on Nigerian uh, junior national teams. Um, like we don't have um, that um, a foundation that shows that this player is really, really on the 17 or on the 20. We've had to, you know, do some kind of a bargain and kind of um, uh, different things at different times. People not, uh, people quarreling with the age of uh, certain on that 17 players and all that. So when we win um, international tournaments or the World Cup, um, it affects the fact that you bring that player that won the under-17 World Cup into the under-20 side, he's not performing at that optimal. You expect him to improve as he improves in age and all that, but then um, you, you find out that some of them just peak 
after playing on the 17th and on the 20, they just peak. And so at the senior national level, they cannot perform. They've already peaked, telling you that the age they use is not quite what they, they are. You know, but in recent times, um, we're trying to get it right. We're trying to throw up at the real um, under 17 or under 20 players. But again, the African system, you know, is that street football system where the best certificates, um, some fathers come up and tell you, my child was born in this year, but uh, there is no best certificate to really prove that. So whatever they say, that, now you born and for me, this is the age of the boy. So it, it, it has a lot of problems. Because parents here are also involved again. I have to come back to the parents. I've had a parent call me up and say, look, I need to get my son into an academy. Yeah, he's very good. Um, he needs exposure. If we can get him into an academy, um, I would be very, very delighted. Um, one of those foreign academies that are in Nigeria, because there's so many of them. I'm okay, like good, yes, I can do that for you. I can make the connect, yes. But how old is your son? I says my son is 16. To start with, at the age of 16, and you want to get into an academy, it's already too late. It's already late. We're talking about getting to an academy at the age of five, maximum six, seven. It's already too late. So I put a question to him, like, are you sure that your son is 16? Because we can actually work on something, maybe not an academy, but get him some kind of trial in a football club in Nigeria, and maybe call some people abroad who are able to help facilitate. He goes, well, um, yeah, officially he's 16, but his real age, he's 22. Ew! It be. Talent, they say, is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift to humanity. Everywhere you look, you can find them. On the streets, on hard earth, or even concrete pitches with makeshift goalposts. Young kids playing around excitedly, sometimes barefoot, kicking the ball, making passes, sparing no effort to achieve the ultimate target score a goal. The facilities are non-existent mostly, substandard at best, but you can see the passion, the energy, and the talent. In some cases, there's the icing on the cake. Heart. Look closely and you'll find the heart of a champion. Egg. Christian, loving father, devoted husband, professional banker, a guy who dabbles a little in entertainment, an avid farmer, and of course a dedicated golfer. But over and above all, a young man who likes to see other young people progress and who loves to take on impossible tasks and missions. Every Nigerian child plays football. Every single one of us played street football. I started playing football probably at about age two, three, in my first neighborhood in Jos. Then we moved to Kaduna, played street football as well. Played football at primary school. I played in church played in my secondary school and I played football until a couple of years ago when I injured my meniscus, had a surgery and technically closed it down my footballing career. I'm not sure if passion moved into business or business moved into passion because I've always been passionate about football, passionate about developing the next generation, passionate about what happens especially in youth football. Until now, I probably am fixated on fixing the problems of Nigerian football. 
All I aspire to do is fix it such that it comes with financial rewards, which is what some people refer to as a business model. That's still a long time coming, so who knows if it eventually becomes a successful model. Right now, the desire and the dream is to fix the problems with Nigerian football, especially youth football. The vision for MPFA is to get kids the right age, playing football the right way, in a proper enabling environment that lets them become the best footballers they can be, but also allows them to become the best human beings that the country Nigeria can produce. The model, the values we teach the kids, the way we play football, and the way we teach football to be played. These are the basic tenets that set us aside. A typical MPFA student would be that student who has come through the ranks between seven and nine, played football with us for two years, whose character has been tested and we've decided he fits the bill for a professional from our academy, who now passes the entrance exam into the secondary school, who also understands how to play football and becomes duly admitted. Right now, the kids are learning how to manage their finances. They are learning about hygiene. They are learning about the importance of hard work. They are learning that they must serve their parents. And most importantly, they are learning that you can fail at football. Therefore, you must have an alternative which for us is the most important lesson we can impart to these kids. That all it takes is one nasty injury and your footballing career is over. Therefore, at every point in time, you must have alternatives to play football. Our kids know that you, won't, you can't come to us at the wrong age. They know we will not condone cheating. They know they have to be as professional every single time they put their feet on the Miss Palace home turf. Each time they put on that shirt and they represent us, every single time they go out onto the streets, they know they represent a brand. We teach them as well to play football the right way. It doesn't matter whether we lose by 10 goals, by 5 goals, we will continue to play football the right way. And of course, most importantly, the values that we teach these kids. As it applies to every production line, the quality of the raw materials and processes determine the outcome. At MPFA, strict adherence to the quality control standards runs from end to end. The kids understand that the only consideration that gets them through every door is merit. This notion is already public knowledge within the North Central Axis, so off the blocks Aspiring footballers set their sights firmly on making the cut at MPFA. Acceptance into the academy is already first stage validation 
of one's potential to be a pro footballer. We we start from the, from the U10, and then some of the basic documents we require. First, you have to be under 10. Second, you have to come with a birth certificate. Thirdly, your immunization card, your first immunization card. That way, we are sure that uh, that's your right age. Because if you take the first immunization and you have that card, it gives us your real age. And then for those that don't have, because for our society. We know that some kids are born at home and then some people don't even care about going to the hospital. You check the class, the, the school uh, results and then the time of admission and then what class is in and, and all of that. Then uh, aside that, we, because what we, when we get to U12 and U15, you find out that um, sometimes you find some exceptional players that didn't start with you, but they are quite good. They go through the same process of bringing all of these, these documents before they join. I said and Miss Palace Football uh, carried me apart because of its uh, dedication to make sure that everything uh, we do is done excellently. We are very thorough, right from planning of uh, training sessions to execution of matches. We make sure excellence is a key word and also um, we try to make sure that we do things differently. And that if you look at look around, involving all the age grades, from U10, U13 to U15, we make sure that we use the right age. And we then never compromise in that regard. Now, along the line, you actually have those external forces, those bad eggs, they're trying to force people on you. We had one incident shortly after we started, I think a year or so into into the academy's life, someone brought a letter saying that um, one big shot somewhere said that uh, he wants some boys to join the academy. I remember one of the coaches calling me as a company secretary to say, uh, there's this letter from this place saying that they have players, that the players can come and join. I categorically told them that I don't want to see the letter. Now, the truth is, I may see the letter and it's somebody you know and you want to, to bend and all of that. But from the get-go, we have said that we want to set standards. We want to do things differently. So we have tried so much in, ex in explaining that to the larger society that we are not interested in having people pay us just to have kids into the system. If you are, if you are okay based on merit, you can have your kids join. Now, this has also ex has been extended to some of the staff or the coaches in the academy. If you have a child, the child can come around and play. If he's good enough, we take him. If he's not good enough, he doesn't make it. Not because um, you are the coach and you're part of the system and you want your child to play and then he has to play. No, he has to be a standard. He has to be there, up there, what we want and how we want before you can make it. So our standards are non-negotiable and we do everything possible to protect it. Um, actually, we've had the, the, such situations which we've been able to make all those who feel um, entitled to having their child understand that there's a standard. The child has to be exceptional and the child has to go through all the processes in order to get in. Okay. One thing that I know that makes uh, Miss Palace World Academy exceptional is the way and nature we groom them. The training is quite different, the discipline is different, the mode of training is different and even the opportunity they have, some people are looking for it. So even because of that, they will have to give the in their best for what lies ahead. As a first and foremost, their age, they are so strict when, when it comes to age category when you come into play in Miss Palace. And apart from that, the discipline. I was impressed with the discipline, the way they, they, they respond to their coaches, to the call. Everything was just near perfect.
paint you a picture. Picture of this beautiful city surrounded by hills. Got beautiful people, beautiful places. Just Line 9 degrees by 10 minutes by 0 seconds north, 9 degrees by 45 minutes and 0 seconds east, northeast Nigeria. The famous city has been a hub for mining, tourism, arts, entertainment and football for decades. Jos is home to MPFA, the dream of a world-class facility and operational structure is firmly in sight. But the long, steady walk towards that lofty goal started three years ago at the Cathedral, Mies Palace, Rayfield, Joss, and the Plateau State Capital. Okay, so in every organization, there's a system. There, there has to be, you know, good planning. So there's the board of um, directors, and then there are the coaches, then the technical team, then the players, you know, then, um, so all is an all encompassing. So if um, there's no structure, that is what you don't see, you know, in most um, academies, football academies in Nigeria, you don't see that kind of structure. Um, if you want to, really you know succeed in whatever you're doing when it comes to sports management you really have to set the structure and then go with the structure we we picked the founding personnel for this academy painstakingly it took interviews over five or six months to locate the people who first of all shared the same dreams as the founders of the academy people who had worked in the youth setup and knew where all of the pitfalls and all of the dead bodies are buried and know exactly how to navigate them. We picked people who understood how football should be played precisely, even when it is kids playing. This combination is what has ensured that up until today, we have the right values. We've also done our best to ensure that everybody who comes through the organization gets the same orientation, gets the same trainings, and they understand our values and our culture. Once we find staff is not a good fit for the culture we are trying to establish at the academy, we have absolutely no problems letting such staff go. Now we have, we have the management, which consists of the, the CEO, the sporting director, the technical director, and then the coaches. We have an admin, and then uh, the medical, and then we have a board. Everything runs through from the CEO downwards, then reports back to the board and then have the feedback and then it flows right through to the team and to the players. Okay, so we're, we're lucky. We started off doing the right things and it was easy to find the right partnership. So we found school partnerships with St. Murumba Secondary School and St. John's College. We get a 65% discount on the fees for each of the kids. Balance of 35% is divided into two halves. We pay 15% as an academy and the parents of the children pay 20%. We found some kids sponsorship deals with Masita, a Dutch sports manufacturer company. We get all our kids at under, at 25% of the cost. The other 75% is amortized in a sponsorship deal which we usually you know, end up not having to contribute in cash. We found a medical partnership with Ola Hospital, which has become our NHIS. So each time the kids need to 
go to hospital or have their medicals done, or the hospital is always on standby. And we found a, good part a great partnership with Miss Palace. So quite a bit of the financial burden is shouldered by Miss Palace, and they help us drive the process for seeing the football academy stay alive and afloat. Our training schedules for the kids, you know, right now we are just at, still at our temporal site. We've not gone to permanent site yet, so we have, um, you know, prepared this way that we have training sessions for Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays. Mondays we have um, um, sessions with coaches where we do analysis, video analysis, and then we plan for the week. Weekends, Saturdays, we have a other program called Pleasure Group. Pleasure Group are for boys that are not really uh, skillful like the ones we have in L the early team. We bring them together, train them. But this set of boys, their parents pay. So if you, when they improve, we, we give them opportunity to go for trials with our early team. And when they make it, they join. We have few of them that have actually have succeeded. And we have more. As I speak to you, we have uh, close to 50 registered kids for that uh, part. We are in the process of um, building a permanent site. We have acquired um, uh, six hectares of land somewhere in, in, in Jaws, and we're looking at starting development by next year. On that uh, level, we'll have enough playing pitches, we'll have hostels, we'll have a mini hotel, swimming pool, and all the facilities that will ensure that these young people get the proper development at a young age so that they grow into superstars in the future. What a typical day at the academy is like. Uh, basically, we come to work in the morning and the bulk of the work starts in the evening during training sessions. But in the morning, we attend to parents that come to see us uh, because we have the pleasure group and then the main team. Mostly the pleasure group parents, people that come to register. If we have letters to type, we do that and all that. But in the evening, mostly from, say, from 2 o'clock till 6, that's when we have the bulk of the work. Where we have to get ready for training, get water for the boys, make sure they are at their training grounds and all of that. So it's from, let's say, 9 a.m. to 1. It's a quiet day at the office, but from 2 to 6, everybody's quite busy. Okay, when they're in competition, their schedule is quite tight because they have to shuffle between school and the competition. For example, just in just in tournament that is going on now, we had to shift some of their exams to next year because of this whole thing. So usually we try to talk to the school to see how they can relieve them a bit to play the ball and then shuffle between exams, classes and all that. It's usually tight for the boys, but we have to find a way to manage the time for them. So our own program or my own program comes when we are about traveling for a tournament outside, then I will prepare a uh, menu, food menu for them. That's when uh, to have a balanced diet of the feeding and everything in it. Some other things they learn is that um, there are days like on Thursdays, they learn how to dance. Dancing is not just for leisure, but dancing is to help them with their footwork when they play football, and then flexibility, how to fall on the field. So we have a program where we bring players around on Saturdays, we call them the pleasure, pleasure team. And there we have you know, a couple of girls under 10, where we teach them the tenants of the game. A female coach who also helps us in some aspects where it's more female, female. Uh, so the advice they always give female football is just go home or go 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 to school, and just just look for another career, but not football. Football are meant for just boys, meant for say. In the academy now, we have about close to thirty female. Yeah, the female team for now we don't have uh, each, category. each category. Yeah, because we're just trying to like see how we can uh, bring them on board to see if we can have age category. But for now, it's just a flat age that we have. That helps them too. And also other things about, we also try to do again, is about morals. You know, as coaches, we make sure we have to instill that in them. How 
you you dress, how you communicate, how you carry yourself in your community, down just even using um, roll on. We teach them that and how to keep proper hygiene. You know, we we'll make sure that they keep to this so that that will set them out. And it has always been setting these boys out amongst their peers. Each time they come together, we have tournaments. You see that these ones are different from others. Hi, I'm Larit. It's my absolute pleasure to take you on the facilities of the Miss Palace Football Academy. I promise it will be fun. Come along with me. Admin office. Here we have our coaches' offices. Right here we have our visitors' dressing room. CEO's office. And our fantastic dressing room where the players dress before their matches. Let's go in, please. Our practice pitch. And our main pitch, the cathedral. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a step. Indeed, many important steps are being taken in pursuit of the ultimate goals of the Academy. and midterm results reiterate the popular maxim. It doesn't take a whole day to recognize sunshine. Depends on the ball. Keep happy feet, don't just stand flat. Keep happy feet. Depends on the ball, Felix.
think I think uh, majorly I talked about the foundation. The foundation has to be gotten right. Uh, the foundation I'm talking about, uh, we we um, we have um, a street football kind of thing where the academies are just mushroom academies. But in recent time, I've seen an academy like a Miss Palace Academy in in Jaws, where they are doing the right thing. If it's under 15, it is under 15. If it's under 13, it is under 13. And that's how we can get a good foundation. Well, I'm here um, to participate and um, observe the processes at um, the Mies Palace Football Academy and um, see what uh, Mr. Emmanuel Aduku is doing and has been doing, been following him for a number of years. And um, so I'm visiting on this occasion to see the boys and he's putting a lot into that and I can see that already. I saw a few games today and um, I'm pretty impressed by, by what I see. Um, that's, he's trying to bridge the gap, you know, as it were, between um, what we do in Nigeria or in Sub-Saharan Africa and what we expect from Europe. I've heard quite a lot about this, to be honest. Uh, from my colleagues, yes, they've spoken so much about the Mies Palace project. So when I got a chance to uh, to be here, um, invited, I thought, yes, let me, let me take a look, have first-hand knowledge of what's going on um, in the city of Jos. And um, the first port of call when we arrived was, you know, the the Mies Palace Academy, and what I saw was was impressive as compared to what I've seen elsewhere, you know, and to think that it's tucked away in the north, which a lot of people think doesn't really have um, what it takes as far as facilities are concerned. A lot of people, when they think academies, are thinking down south, you know, but up north here, I, I think what they have clearly, clearly um, supersedes what I have seen anywhere else. Uh, Mies Palace uh, Football Academy kind of gives me hope, so to say, because I won't lie to you. Uh, I, 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 will, I felt like we're like in a doldrum and we might just never come out of it. And the fact that I have seen the processes they put in place, I have seen how tedious and meticulous they are about getting the children at the right age. I've seen how they're very particular about the coaching system. I've seen how they're looking to put structures in place. I went into this children's dressing room. I'm like, woof, oh, wow. Some NPFL clubs don't have that kind of dressing room. Now, you see, you're already creating a mindset in those children. I've seen cases, look, even with our NPFL players, when the European players come through, and you know those boys are big boys, they're making big bucks. Because of course, if you convert Naira to uh, dollar to Naira now, at the time, knew, you know, so they're coming with designer bags, you know, looking all through their perfume, they say. Then you have the MPFL, they, they are usually like this, you know, they, they feel inferior. Many times they've said it, we've heard it, we've seen it. Why? Because they're not exposed to all of that. Yeah. So, of course, when they step into the pitch, they would always, always panda, even though it might not be glaringly to the boys in Europe. But you see, when you're giving these boys global best practice, you're seeing it already. If you take them to Europe, this is something they're kind of used to. So they don't go there and go, now, nah, wow, you know. The reason we couldn't go past Argentina at 1994 World Cup, that game we were supposed to win, was because they were all, all players were all stricken because of the, the late Diego Maradona. Can you imagine somebody you watch, you probably idolize, and now you have to tackle him and you're nice to him now. <laughs> You'll be nice to him now. So we have so much high expectation on them and they are not disappointing. You see, before they have their own tournament, people thought it's because their own tournament they are doing well. So any other tournament now they win, they are ranked the best team. If they did not win, they must be came second and their players must be selected among the best players. Some of them, they are really growing. Two days ago, NFF officials were here to witness the Women's League that we had on the finals. When they saw, they said at least four of the players should be going to under 13. They should take the five players to under 15. Hilary Carr, the coach of under 15, national under 15, was here with the coordinator of the under 13, under 15. Should I, they are all here, they saw them. So in every year you came, 
to Miss Palace, you see a lot of development. Expectations for this academy. Uh, you know, we started with actually, the projection was five years, and within two years, it was just mind blowing. And uh, if I say in the next <laughs> 10 years, I'll be lying. I would say my projection would be that in the next two years, we should have one or two in the top European uh, clubs, the academies, and also have about um, half of the U15 in national team. That is even playing out today. Recently, we, we had the, the Justini that is ongoing now. Uh, about six, seven have been selected, and I believe more will be selected into the national team. Two experiences I would that will live with me for the rest of my life would be the case with Melchizedek, the first time the team traveled out of Jos. And I remember they came straight out of school to the cathedral, our home pitch. They had their bags. And his mom came with some food to hand over to him before he traveled. And I remember her standing by the door of the bus and she was in tears, absolutely. And I said to her, what's the problem? And she said, my son is so properly kitted up. He looks neat. He's about to get into a bus. He's going to travel out of Joss for the first time. And he's even got police escort. Who would ever think in our family that we would have a policeman ever escort any of us? You know, she prayed for all of us at the academy that day. You know, some of, of the experiences makes you get so bushed up. Um, why I'm getting this emotional is just because of how we started. Uh, you see, our first trip to Kaduna was very emotional. Some of them have traveled out of Joss. And you could see the excitement. Some have not entered the bus before. We went to Kaduna, stayed in the hotel. The excitement that even um, allowing the porters to do their job, they want to do it themselves. <laughs> Clean up their rooms. And, uh, you know, his palace has provided us up to the depth that never expected. The second experience for me has happened two years in a row now. Each time we finish the Just Chilean Football Invitational, we have a gala night. And at the gala night, we present awards. You know, we have this kid, Ahmed Musa, who's won the award for highest goal scorer and most valuable player of the tournament two years in a row, back to back. Having Ahmed's grandmom and his mom on the podium yesterday moved me to the brink of tears. It was for me a dream come true. To see a child who not many gave a chance to be anything come through our doors and now become an even more famous or a bigger household name than his older siblings who play football. You can't ask for too many things that make you happy or take your breath away. Hi, Sunana Ahmed Musa. I'm now going to Miss Palace Football Academy.
Team, I come at team. You know, now we my family. Now need the team, now the coaches now. From a far match, not in any and then Samo, and Chubul Kura would have any. A Mahakam Allah be sued, Nasamo, Nachiba, Hamadi, Natima, Kamatimina, and Kuma play you young when the Muchabuga was a song when you mean to come and be in Chabuga. Now, like a what do we do now? He tried to find his mistake. Back to this man again. Abed Musa, and he's not in there. This will be danger. That is our gentleman. He has done this man. What do we do with the ball? Let's go. Mr. Sunday, the coming meeting. Oh, my God. 